biomedical engineering professor Assad is the Ford professor at MIT. He is the head of the Darmanoff Laboratory for Information Systems and Technology. Uh, I've known, uh, I've been impressed when I came to uh, join the Darmanoff Lab with Professor Assad as, first of all, the amazing amount of work he manages to get done, but he's also raised a lot of money in support of uh, information technology. So in fact, if there's someone who's responsible for our mechanical engineering department having the, its very strong program and in information, that Professor Assad certainly deserves credit for. Please, Harry. Good morning. Uh, thanks, to, uh, Seth. Uh, now that the uh, now and the Falcon uh, described the uh, big picture, uh, I would like to uh, uh, exemplify uh, some of their comments, uh, statements by uh, describing uh, the specific research programs that we have been conducting. Uh, as a matter of fact, the quite exciting things are happening in the double laboratory, um, and I'd, I'd like to uh, do my best to convince you. Uh, and how the information uh, um, and technology, including instrumentations and the networking staff, uh, can change both uh, um, exploring the new uh, frontiers and uh, uh, somewhat to revitalize the uh, areas of which has been already mature in the mainstream mechanical engineering. Now, first of all, I'd like to uh, uh, raise this instrumentation and networking issues, a quite important a part of the uh, uh, information. Um, uh, next speaker, uh, uh, Mr. Sunny Su, uh, who is the, I guess, the star of uh, the uh, internet, uh, uh, brought in this kind of concept of networking, and we learned a lot uh, uh, from him. Um, we are putting in lots of little gadgets in diverse areas, and we developed the little um, computers uh, that has the widest uh, you know, transmission systems. Uh, scale around almost every, every place that you can imagine, including the human body, um, getting the uh, good access to uh, the, any machines, including robots and some other staffs. But imagine that you are sort of uh, augmented uh, by the ability to communicate with other machines. What can we do with it? Or we, you can get the, uh, you know, uh, your vital signs at all times, getting a huge amount of information. That we totally change the way we do design uh, in these areas. Now, this little gadget that we call this iCoin technologies, because you know, we have a little of the microcontrollers and having uh, some uh, computers and the RF transmitters uh, combined with some batteries all in a small package, as small as the dime or, uh, or, or, or nickels. And uh, actually, these are communicating wirelessly with the, uh, some uh, uh, computers. And now, uh, things are going to uh, mobile computing. And uh, these, uh, the PDAs combined with the cellular phone, it's going to be a one a gadget uh, sometime soon. And they are replacing, uh, I brought in just a brand new uh, laptop, but this is going to be an older technology. It's going to be replaced by those things. So we, we made a connection all these. And instead of using the in different devices here and there, but we use the unified uh, you know, systems so that we can actually do uh, uh, lots of computations and uh, communications and as much. But this is the first uh, you know, device we put together. We have RF transmitters. It can uh, transmit the signals up to 30, uh, 100 feet and quite stably. Now, one of the very interesting <laughs> problems is we all designed this for low E, low energy computation and communications. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, Roshan mentioned that the uh, computer speed is ever increasing, but at the same time, what is interesting to me is that the power required for each gate uh, switch has been decreasing as quickly as the speed of the uh, computers increased. So uh, as a matter of fact, quite a big you know, um, uh, uh, number of gates uh, can be powered by a single battery that lasts uh, for the entire lifespan of that chip. So it's going to be disposable. But, but the, still the bottleneck is RF transmission. And uh, well, there are quite a few research programs going on in this area in the mobile computing uh, community. But we look at this issue at the very fundamental levels of uh, coding and modulation, uh, which is very much you know, uh, fundamental part. So what we'd, what we'd like to do is that you like to transmit some signals, say message M1 to MQ, and uh, you have to code it. You have to represent the uh, information in some form 
and we have uh, you know collections of such codes in here. And what I'd like to do is actually, well, and in the sending of each information, uh, each uh, symbols here, you have to spend some energy, say EI. And what, what I'd like to do is to uh, minimize the average energy per transmitting uh, uh, message uh, E. Now, obviously, what you can do is that well, um, you you can actually um, uh, uh, evaluate these codes in terms of the energy. Uh, expenditure and uh, uh, put them in the increasing order of energy uh, consumption. And uh, uh, assuming that you know the uh, source symbol of probability, you can put them in the, in the descending order of uh, uh, probability. And then you make a match between these two. And the way to minimize this one is simply you assign the uh, code words with less energy to more probable messages. But this is just nothing you know, special. It's just you know, extensions of uh, Huffman coding, which is very well known stuff. But what is a very important, exciting things are happening in this uh, code book part, which is a collection of codes. Now, in the communication communities, uh, things are going higher bit and longer bit and uh, higher transmissions. And the rate has been the most important uh, you know, factors for many years. But looking at the, those uh, applications I just uh, showed you in the uh, first uh, view graphs, many things uh, can be transmitted rather slowly, rather slowly. But uh, battery power is more important. I can uh, tell you a hundred uh, you know, examples of that. Now, given that, well, we can actually uh, 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 design a special codes that is optimal in terms of the energy savings. Now, if you just uh, use the uh, standard uh, you know, coding techniques, so let me take this example on of keying it uh, to begin with. The, you need to send certain bit uh, lengths, so it's called the uh, word lengths, and which has a kind of mixture of the high bit and low bit, and uh, quite a few things are happening. Now, uh, looking at the simple the, uh, transmission form on of keying, the energy is, is consumed only when the RF transmitter is on. Then that's actually active in the things. So obviously what you need to do is to uh, reduce the number of high bits. Then you can actually minimize the uh, uh, energy consumption. Now that the, uh, suppose you can speak a little slowly, you, have, uh, you can put some redundant bits in here. You can actually generate the codes which, which uh, do not need many high bits. It turns out the, uh, just a few high, uh, high bits shown here can represent the many, many uh, um, codes. Um, this is a, a, a called the redundancy of uh, uh, or energy saving, and we explore how much we can actually gain the energy saving by adding some redundancy to it. Now, uh, the uh, uh, set of uh, codes Having the least the number of high bits uh, is called the uh, uh, optimal code book. The way you can generate it, starting with the all low bits and then uh, uh, one bit, uh, and the whole uh, one length is used, and then actually two bits you can put, and then actually you count this one until you uh, arrive at the point where the, you, you, the same number of uh, uh, code words that you want to uh, uh, ship out the number of you know, uh, so symbols, then you can cut up and they do not use the old other um, uh, code patterns having higher bits. So this is a simple one. Of course, the, uh, you know, in the practice, they have been using a much more sophisticated constellation techniques. The one that I talk about is only this one, but there are many, many things in the happening in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but no matter what, the one interesting property that we found is that the uh, to, to be able to send the stuff in the, with the minimum energy, the necessary condition for it is that a code book, that collection of book, um, codes must be an optimal code book having the least number of uh, energy in it. Now that the, uh, so um, although the probabilities of the source uh, um, uh, symbols may vary depending on the applications, but uh, uh, the code book part that can be fixed and uh, we can implement this. And on our icon, we have uh, such uh, you know, uh, optimal code books, which is tuned to the specific uh, the probability distributions involved in the systems. And, uh, and after that, we just assign the optimal um, an assignment in between. Now, taking uh, one step further, a few steps further from this point, uh, uh, we, we means uh, me and the Seth, Professor Seth Lloyd and Young Hunter together, are marching towards the much more challenging uh, um, device, which is called iGrain. 
This is the uh, uh, complete self-contained computer with a battery in it and um, uh, 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 the wireless communication device in it. And uh, that is as large as the grain of uh, uh, rice. And uh, uh, we do an integrated the computation and communication and a one chip CPU and wireless transmission, which is not an easy job to be signal stuff. Um, and, uh, and more importantly, we do an integrated chip design, a battery design, um, and, uh, that, and actually explore the many uh, opportunities uh, uh, to uh, cleverly, wisely use the battery design in, consistent with the uh, chip design. And uh, hopefully we can uh, last uh, such a device for five years and it turns out to be dis disposable. Now, Having such a device, we can put this one in unusual places, in particular in the human body. And uh, we are, um, but actually we've been working on this one in the last several years, try to um, uh, put the devices on the human, uh, non-intrusive and uh, comfortable way. Um, and as I said, that actually a laptop computer will be replaced by PDAs and some mobile gear connected to the internet. So uh, if we can make a connection between this one and the many uh, part of the body, um, and we can do lots of interesting stuff. And we call this a wireless body local area network. Um, imagine that uh, you have uh, such ability. Um, now, we have uh, quite a few uh, uh, interesting applications of that for well, human computer interactions and uh, most specifically uh, recently personal robotics uh, uh, the booming and um, uh, the uh, key uh, issues in personal robotics is basically how you uh, let the, your robot uh, recognize what you're really doing. So um, actually human uh, uh, measurement or a human side of instrumentation plays a major role. And as a matter of fact, you know, uh, in this case, uh, we are, uh, the students, uh, Steve Mascaro, working together with this robot and building something like this. And this robot is clever enough to understand what he's doing and by keep tracking of the, his hand motion. As a matter of fact, the, most of the jobs uh, performed by humans are by means of the hand motion. So if you actually keep track of the hand motion, so we can get the most of the information they needed. And I'm, let me just uh, talk to uh, one, this, uh, one specific technology we developed. Um, that is to uh, replace the uh, data glob. And Pastor, you know that this is a kind of existing technologies, and we can measure the data, uh, the hand motion. Uh, we, we can measure the bending angles and the touching force and, and such. But once you wear such a glove, you get the, you, you get the lost the uh, haptic sense. Now, what we are doing is to uh, measure the hand motion, including uh, this actually, uh, you know, force acting at the uh, tip, without uh, covering the hands. How can we do that? But traditional mechanical engineers, you know, if you try to measure some force at the fingertip, you place some uh, you know, sensor pads here. Perhaps we are clever enough to make, it, make things very thin, but still we lose half the sense. So what is the solution? Now, if you have uh, you know, fingers and, and, and uh, the tables uh, in front of you, please place your fingers on top of the uh, uh, table surface. And look at your fingernail, what's gonna happen? Yeah, please do it. You know, and uh, you find something, good idea, that your nails change its color. And then that's a very clear uh, change. So we instrumented the uh, uh, fingernails um, with the, just a standard of micro LEDs and the photo detectors and the wireless really communicating this one to other part. This is the device with the bulb and uh, this is just like a teenager, the fake nails and we can actually measure all the stuff. Now we have a very interesting uh, color change and as described here. Now what is uh, really interesting uh, to me is that uh, well we can even measure the bending angle, not only the force acting on it, but uh, we can measure the uh, force, uh, actually the, the bending angles uh, on top of it. Um, this is actually a quick uh, video clip and I'll uh, show you uh, how uh, this one is really working. Let me just skip this first uh, few portion. Okay. Now, uh, oops. This is brand new Windows 2000 and it may have some <laughs> trouble. Well, let me just uh, hold up this guy. The past this one is good enough. Well, it's a kind of a technology vulnerable. Can you see this? Uh, yeah, this is the uh, you know, first part of the uh, video. And uh, basically we measure the um, uh, bending angles and just uh, to get the reference, uh, we just put some uh, 
uh, signed here. Uh, shown here is basically the tip of, of the finger, and we instrumented it with it. And uh, we bend it, and then actually a door, uh, this one, is to show the bending angle measured by the, this uh, fingernail sensor. And then nothing in there, it's not covered at all, but uh, if you bend this one, we can measure this. Um, and the top one is to indicate um, uh, the actual bending angle. As a matter of fact, uh, this is to uh, uh, get to some reference, uh, making comparison with the, uh, the actual, uh, actual uh, uh, measurement uh, taken by this. And actually, this is a touching part. If you touch some surface, the um, sensor output changes. So uh, you can get the uh, you know, information as to how much it's being touched. And this one uh, turns out to be working very quickly. We can't get the uh, measurement of uh, you know, uh, pianist motion, but uh, uh, it's quite quick, uh, um, amazingly quick. Um, Now, let me just uh, move on and uh, uh, to uh, next one. Yeah, this is the last part. It's actually moving and tapping quickly, and it, it, you know, it actually uh, follows that one. OK. Now, um, Moving forward, as a matter of fact, the, uh, the finger nail bed uh, um, has quite interesting uh, uh, characteristics, although it's uh, uh, not much known. Uh, we have uh, uh, quite rich um, uh, capillary uh, system to right beneath this one, a capillary tube is uh, twice longer than the other part, so many little the force and, and actually changes the color. Now we are mechanical engineering and try to understand why that happened. So this is the kind of a fluid mechanics and uh, 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 the tissue mechanics part. And then we try to design, uh, build some model of how it really works and then I check it in with the uh, on actual experiments. Now we are moving towards the wireless uh, um, uh, sensor that having that eye coin communicating with the uh, any budget uh, the gadget. And, uh, one more interesting stuff with this is that we can actually uh, measure the shear force. Um, well, shear force is generally is very difficult to measure, but uh, uh, with this, we can actually uh, see the very distinct uh, you know, color pattern change, so we can measure that. Now, what is the killer app of this? Now, we are actually applying this to uh, replace the computer pointer. Uh, if you use the IBM laptop, uh, you see a little, you know, red stuff in the middle of the uh, keypad, and uh, that's sometimes very difficult to move. But uh, with this one, you can just uh, use uh, any surface and, uh, and point to what you really want to actually look at and open the file. Um, well, of course, uh, you know, this, uh, uh, once you instrument the human, uh, there are many ways of getting information from the human, such as, in this case, uh, uh, in this case uh, the uh, traditionally, uh, some uh, switches are uh, embedded in the wall, but uh, uh, with this uh, uh, nail sensor, you don't have to do that. You can just uh, uh, post, uh, paste the, um, the picture of the switch, and then that, uh, once you touch this guide, and then you get the information. Of course, we need to have some additional sensors to locate the fingers. So in our case, we're using the magnetic, magnetic tracker, but that uh, can be done. And in this case, the robot is actually controlled with many uh, uh, basically switches embedded on, on this table. Now, uh, this, uh, the type of uh, virtual switch um, enhance the human machine um, uh, communications. Uh, for instance, in this case, it's the traditional switches, and then many people get the trouble uh, to understand uh, which, uh, what this switch means and the result in the certain action here, making connections a very difficult task. But uh, on the virtual switch, we place the switches where the task uh, 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 take place. So it's very easy to... Uh, uh, understand. Now, now let me just talk about a little bit more mechanical oriented the work and how they are connected to uh, information stuffs. Now this is actually the care project that we're doing and uh, this is the stuff you see in the daily uh, uh, lives. Uh, the, the patient here has been struggling moving from transferring uh, from this you know, wheelchair to bed and ba bed to uh, uh, wheelchair. And uh, first, we developed the kind of a hybrid uh, bed chair systems, uh, um, uh, 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 
This one uh, can be pulled out of, uh, in a bed and then move around uh, freely. It's a omnidirectional uh, chair. So we've been working this one with the uh, VA hospitals. And what they experience is that they're having a many, uh, many um, actuators are a little difficult to operate, but we place the virtual switches on all these places. And the first we uh, look at uh, how those caregivers uh, tend to touch uh, to move, for instance, the raising this back, and we place the uh, virtual switch there. Of course, the virtual switches are sometimes uh, on the uh, public, so like this one, where the uh, uh, normally you can't put the uh, traditional switches, but we can place uh, such uh, stuff. Now. Along these directions, uh, um, let me describe to you one uh, very challenging uh, project in this, called the surface wave actuation. And the goal is to move the uh, bedridden patient in two directions, in X and Y directions, without lifting. So the uh, surface must have some kind of functionality so that the uh, patient can be moved uh, in any directions. And in this case, uh, we embed some kind of actuators in here and uh, the surface will, uh, will generate a sort of motion. In this case, it's going along this kind of circular trajectory, just like a, um, and a water uh, surface wave, and uh, having some phase lag, uh, you create this kind of uh, terrain, and then a body is attached to this point, uh, whereas the tangential velocity is in this direction. Now, <laughs> And natural waves, uh, you know, it's not so much inefficient and very difficult to realize uh, mechanically. Uh, but instead, uh, we made uh, some changes to it. That is to uh, put some kind of uh, uh, um, little uh, notch uh, in here uh, on the membrane. We call this extender. And then place the object on top of it. What is interesting here is that uh, we, since we have uh, this device, uh, when this actually uh, moved uh, uh, in out of phase, they just uh, move this kind of uh, an action, um, a rotate about this, so create the additional velocity at the tip of this arm. And uh, uh, of course, no one wants to say uh, lying on the, uh, the a bed of nails like this, so we'll, we put the additional membrane on top of it and pressurize it, creating a very soft surface when the uh, patient is lying on it, uh, sleeping for a long time. In case we need to move the patient to give some stimuli or change the uh, uh, posture, we actually um, um, uh, depressurize this uh, chamber and then actually these uh, uh, extenders uh, uh, comes out. And I have a second video, which is interesting. That, let me just try it. And this, whoops, have a different. Uh, We'll see. Um, let's go. Uh, this is Microsoft, so we can't blame. Uh, yeah, right, not yet. But this one, um, excuse me, uh, this guy, oops. Well, we have a bunch of um, uh, little fingers in here. They are moving a certain way. And what you see here, the jellos. It's a very fragile object being transported. Um, actually, bedridden patients have a very fragile skin. So uh, amazingly, this can be transported uh, you know, very gently. Um, it's uh, actually moving, and uh, we can move in any directions. Uh, and interestingly, the, um, uh, beneath this particular mat, oh, this is actually 50 pounds of load we can transport in this one, in this way. Um, uh, each uh, element of this one is just moving up, up and down motions, just one directional motion, but we have a bed of actuators beneath this. Now, I'll close it and... Okay, well, currently the size is just uh, transporting a little baby like this, but, uh, but uh, how can we actually extend it to a size of a full size of bed? And, uh, um, well, first of all, um, we need to introduce at this point uh, the brand new world uh, actuator technologies, because to make uh, such, you know, uh, many uh, little motions uh, on the bed, 
Uh, we know this upper part, uh, you know, it's working very well. And then now we are um, uh, working on the nail of such an actuators. Now, the one the technology we're using is basically uh, putting the iCoin in here. By the way, iCoin has uh, uh, PWM generators in it, and uh, uh, it has uh, all ability to control this uh, once you put the uh, simple uh, built-in power stage. So these are sort of you know, uh, smart motors. Everything is there, and uh, basically we can eliminate the heavy wiring. Well, we try to eliminate all the wires here and actually bending this one on the uh, uh, power bus line, and we superimpose the signals on here so that these uh, devices can be coordinated in a certain way. Well, of course, uh, um, well, more important application than maybe automobiles and some other places where there's so many, so many motors are being used, but, um, um, and then as a matter of fact, uh, they're handling the heavy harness, cables after cables, a little you know, very uh, difficult jobs. So if we can actually put them together, they put everything in one cable, uh, I mean uh, 12 volts uh, power lines, and nothing else, that pays off. Um, well, actually, uh, working on this kind of uh, work, we, I find that the, um, well, even the traditional mechatronic system design, putting the communications and um, um, uh, networking stuff in the early stage of a system design turns out to be very important, um, uh, dealing with the, uh, uh, such complex systems are having many, many actuators in it, but just a traditional approach is too costly so that uh, we should uh, develop the other technologies in doing so. Now, let me just move on to a wearable or health monitoring system, which has been a major part of the project. In the back in 96, uh, we proposed this kind of systems, having a ring sensor monitoring the vital signs of these patients and putting this one the data into some place, uh, someone watching this all the times. Now, we got the patents on this ring sensors, uh, basically monitoring the um, pulse and the saturated oxygen level. And uh, every year we develop the new ones, which is now very reliable. Also, uh, in that course, uh, you know, we succeeded in the measuring the blood pressure without using a cuff. This is a traditional uh, method of uh, measuring the um, uh, systolic and diastolic uh, pressures. But uh, we instead use the uh, uh, very different technologies. Uh, we're using some sort of a sensor fusion techniques and the common filtering to get the uh, uh, blood pressure. Um, by a combination of little sensors. In this case, uh, two ring sensors plus an EIP, electric impedance plate seismograph, uh, can reconstruct the blood pressure uh, when these three uh, measurements are done uh, at the same time. And we did some uh, um, uh, benchmarking with the FDA approved the tonometer and our common filter sensor fusion techniques uh, can create the as good as the uh, waveform as the, those uh, FDA approved the devices. Um, well, this actually is not just a high pressure and low pressure, but it's a complete waveform that can be um, estimated, which uh, provides a very rich variety of information such as the cardiac contraction strength and uh, peripheral uh, vascular resistance information. Now, the hardest job in putting the sensor to humans is basically the uh, motion artifact. In this uh, ring sensor case, we have to uh, gently hold uh, the device so that the, uh, we do not uh, interfere with the uh, blood circulation in here. Now, it uh, took some time to um, uh, solve this problem, and we came up with this uh, double ring uh, uh, constructions having all heavy stuff in the outer rings and the inner rings are holds the only the sensor unit uh, which is extremely uh, lightweight. Uh, so even though you move the hands, uh, um, the inertial force created on this is F equal to MA and M is so small that the, uh, uh, the force acting on it is very much negligible. So it's a kind of axiomatic uh, you know, approach. We basically decouple the functionality and we solve the lots of the problems. So in case uh, you actually touch the Simpson something, uh, because no one is actually uh, administrating uh, this kind of uh, um, uh, measurement. So the patient just moved this one and uh, doing some daily jobs. So well, it may touch in some other place, but I know the force acting on it is basically shielded by this, not affecting the uh, internal force. 
but we did some uh, finite element analysis so again a mechanical engine problem and then actually uh, um, grab the precise model of the tissue mechanics as to and how these are really measured and how we can improve the uh, performance. We did the benchmarking with the uh, EKG and the PPG, FDA approved uh, devices and then uh, this ring sensors has no significant difference um, in terms of pulse um, uh, compared with the EKG and other FDA approved uh, photoperiodic Even though we move this one or touch this one, we get the consistent data. And uh, everything is designed for uh, low power consumption. It will continue 360 days. Now, what is the missing link? Uh, we have developed quite a few things, but so it takes some time to uh, get the uh, um, uh, uh, used in the real uh, medical community. Uh, missing link is basically the lack of a protocol, uh, how it should be measured and how it should be monitored and how data should be used. Um, but this continuous monitoring uh, you know, concept uh, uh, is new and then actually it, there's no such you know, uh, really useful device and gadgets that being available. Therefore, when asking the doctors, they don't have a clear idea how to really, really use it. Many of them really like it, but I know it uh, comes down to uh, the specific questions about the protocol. It is a different story. Um, now, the, uh, the new device uh, uh, with the iCoin has a bidirectional com uh, communication abilities. So uh, actually, we are planning uh, this kind of uh, field test uh, exploiting the IT. Well, um, uh, here's the device on the, uh, on the patient side, and it's collected primarily by this uh, PDA and the cellular phone that to uh, the website, and actually this one is uh, monitored by the doctor's office. We are uh, deploying about uh, 100 uh, ring sensors at the various locations, and we really um, like to see the, how the doctor uses this one. As a matter of fact, we provide the uh, uh, large uh, selections uh, uh, choice, uh, options of uh, different uh, uh, measurements and protocols and uh, do doctors uh, make decisions as to which one to be taken and uh, that uh, may require the, some change on this ring side. Perhaps the programs need to be changed, but that program can be downloaded from the website so that then, although we have hundreds of uh, icons in the field, but we can remotely change the program and, the, and the change the way we basically uh, collect the data. And what I would like to do is that MIT uh, double flap, we, we actually monitor, tap the, all the information uh, sent between the patient side and the doctor's office to see how the doctors are using this and ex exploiting uh, new ways of monitoring uh, those cardiovascular activities in a continuous manner. Well, um, so the collecting data is um, ever since easy. And, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, now the vast information is coming out. But the problem is that uh, physical systems are highly coupled. And uh, well, natural systems are basically highly coupled. Although for design, we should be able to decouple it. But uh, unfortunately, um, uh, many physiological systems are coupled. For instance, cardiovascular systems, blood pressure, blood pressure changes depending on renal state or respiration state. And many things may, may change. Now, no single doctor can cover all these uh, areas. So, we try to find some ways of developing uh, technology to um, put the, all the pieces of knowledge together. In particular, uh, each system has a simulator, and then each and expert developed uh, in, a, in the code these uh, uh, simulation programs. And if we have some ways of uh, running all these all together, by like exchanging parameters and variables all together, we can uh, study the um, uh, coupled behavior of such systems. Um, and this is called the uh, co-simulation environment. And I don't want to go to the details, but I know, well, besides the very much uh, c computer and the software problems, the hardest part of the problem is really the dynamics and uh, um, uh, dynamics and, and the part of the problem. You, you have uh, two sub-simulators uh, coded separately, but you try to put together to uh, solve the couple of the problem, and these uh, state variables are not no more in independent, have to conform to some bounding conditions, and uh, you can't uh, reduce the, these, uh, eliminate these variables in case they are all the nonlinear. So what you need to do is basically um, code, uh, use the existing codes and uh, run it uh, together. Well, you know, it, it happening, for instance, actually, this is the um, uh, building energy 
uh, uh, systems and many vendors uh, bring in the different uh, part of uh, devices, in this case, and some evaporator or heat exchangers, they have a pretty good uh, uh, knowledge about these, uh, and they have some simulators in here, but I try to put them together to see how these work together. For instance, the uh, uh, mass flow rate must be consistent, and the, and the pressure of these three points must be the same, which actually poses the sort of algebraic constraints. It turns out the system becomes algebraic, uh, uh, differential algebraic uh, equations, and we uh, uh, if we have some ways of solving this kind of problem effectively, that actually makes things much easier. And we solve this by using the control theory standpoint, uh, seeing this kind of differential uh, uh, direct equations as a feedback process, uh, treating this um, output, uh, this uh, algebraic constraint, which is to be driven zero, and this is treated as output function and close the feedback loop so that this uh, output is to be driven to zero. And we designed this feedback control re very rigorously by using control theory such as the sliding mode controls and such. This is to give the precisely the error bound and uh, uh, stability conditions rather than just doing the um, trying the error jobs. Of course, these things are very important nowadays and people are talking about e-commerce and uh, uh, you have the, uh, they have uh, big supply chain systems and the automaker has to make decisions as to which um, uh, components are usable in these systems and they do largely by using simulators. They are no longer using the data, data chart and stuff but they use uh, the simulators and overnight they have to make a quick decisions. And what you need to do is actually getting a simulators from here, you must be able to co-run those simulators with the uh, main part of your product such as the main body or engine control systems and you have to make a quick decisions and, and you can't change the code originally, you have to run it uh, all together. So the way I see it in uh, IT, in, uh, um, um, it's a, um, it's a, it's a nice uh, um, catalysis for integrating ME disciplines. Um, what traditionally in our department, uh, we've been using energy as an uh, uh, interdisciplinary quantity to uh, describe the, um, all these fields in a unified way. Now, I think from my point of view, information is now playing the same similar role and extending that where information is the most fundamental, the common factor that actually uh, uh, integrate all these stuff, and I think that is the kind of a direction that we are uh, looking at. And uh, just to acknowledge that the, uh, this, most of the jobs have been done under the sponsorship of Home Automation Healthcare Consortium and three grants from National Science Foundations. And uh, I acknowledge many of my colleagues in the Telov Lab who brought me a very different uh, um, type of uh, expertise, and uh, we learned a lot from them. Thank you very much. Well, in the interest of time, because we're now running quite behind schedule, I should say we'll defer questions, ask Harry questions at the break or lunch. Our next speaker is uh, Sonny Sue. Um, those of you who know uh, uh, Nam Sue know that he can be quite persuasive. He persuaded me to leave physics and join the mechanical engineering department. Uh, Sonny Sue was already a well-established professor of electrical engineering when Nam uh, exerted his persuasive powers on Sonny. Uh, uh, unlike Al Gore, uh, Sunny Sue did not invent the internet. Um, <laughs> however, unlike Al Gore, he did, invent, he did invent a key part of what is going to become the next generation of internet, ATM or asynchronous transfer mode. Uh, so uh, in what's going to be coming in the internet over the next 10 years, Professor Sue has played a key role in making uh, this possible. So are you, you all set this, Sonny? Yeah. Great. So it depends on the time while we are setting up, I just want to mention that I didn't know that uh, Seth uh, said that he didn't know anything about the internet. <coughs> I'm <mean>, sorry, <laughs> about mechanical engineering. Uh, when he interviewed, uh, I guess, six years ago? Yeah. Yeah. But when I interviewed, I definitely told my the faculty research committee that I know a lot about mechanical engineering in order to get into the mechanical engineering department. You know, of course, I've been learning a lot about mechanical engineering uh, you know, since I uh, came to MIT. Uh, more than four years ago. Um, so, so what I'm going to um, <clears throat> discuss today, I have to apologize because I have a very really serious flu 
for the past couple of days, uh, uh, is about the next generation internet technologies. I guess it's not exaggerating to say that um, the recent uh, information revolution has to do a lot with the internet. And of course, I guess a lot of the, uh, the bull market in the, in the stock market has a lot to do with the internet too. Um, so, and I'm also teaching a uh, undergraduate course. I guess it, will be, it is the first uh, course offered by MIT at the very freshman uh, sophomore level on the internet. And I used to like to, uh, when, when I teach class, I usually like to uh, tell the students there are really three key elements of the internet. First is the applications, um, the, the, the well-known World Wide Web actually uh, spawns the widespread use of the internet. And uh, sooner or later, we can actually talk over the internet. Of course, currently, you can actually get some software which allow you to have free long distance call, but the quality is still not very good. But in the future, the quality will get better and better. And very soon, we'll have actually free long distance call or flat rate long distance call, uh, uh, nationally or even internationally. Okay. And um, in the very f near future, we will see a lot more other applications of the internet. For example, networking physical objects, okay, using the internet. And Professor Sama will be talking about, we'll begin from the talk in the afternoon, and uh, in the use of the internet to network physical objects. That is a very recent project that we have started at MIT, uh, funded by a number of uh, industrial companies. Okay. And that will have a lot of uh, application or impact on manufacturing inventory control as well as supply chain management. Okay? Another key component of the internet is network protocols. Um, I guess most of you use the World Wide Web uh, and use the Netscape browser or Internet Explorer to browse the web. And the HTTP protocol that you use actually runs on top of TCP IP. And many other data applications use TCP IP. And then at the lower layer is the link and physical uh, layer technologies, including uh, uh, your uh, cable modem technology, ADSL for the broadband access, as well as the, um, the, the older technologies called asynchronous transfer mode that uh, Seth uh, uh, mentioned before. Um, also, we are seeing the WDM optical technologies uh, coming up and being used uh, in the access area too. So let me go into a bit more detail describing all these different technologies. Okay. And before that, I just want to tell you about some key challenges okay, um, that we face in developing the next generation internet. Okay. First of all, the internet is about scalability. Okay. And in the very near future, we will see the internet being used to connect maybe billions of computers uh, and embedded processors. Okay. And uh, again, in the future, we will see that the internet is going to be used to connect physical objects. Okay. And that might be linked to even trillions okay, of every piece of physical item that you can imagine. Okay. And uh, the second challenge is in the efficiency. Currently, we use fiber optics okay, that can provide a lot of raw bandwidth. Okay. The challenging issue is how you can turn all this raw capacity to usable bandwidth, okay. meaning that you can provide end-to-end user-to-user performance in the uh, range of gigabit or even terabit per second. Okay? Uh, currently, terabit per second is already available in backbone technologies, linking uh, very big backbone routers. But uh, most users could not even get multi-megabit per second to the desktop. Okay? And the third issue is about quality of service. Okay? What that means is current internet is based on the best effort service paradigm, in the sense that when you try to uh, visit a website, for example, uh, sometimes you really have to wait for seconds, if not minutes, because you have no control of the current congestion status in the network. And if you talk about futuristic applications like tele robotics, okay, tele telesurgery, you require really very tight control of the bandwidth as well as the delay. Okay? So that's what we mean by the quality of service. And today's internet doesn't have that. Okay? And of course, uh, in the very near future, we'll see the convergence of cellular phones and internet devices together. And um, currently, a, uh, if you buy a cell phone like this uh, from Sprint PCS, it offers you about only 10 kilobit per second. 
because the existing cellular technologies are optimized for voice communications, okay? uh, but not for browsing the web or downloading uh, big files. Okay? And uh, the goal in the next generation internet project that I have uh, involved with is to really increase the rate to a thousand times more, okay, to multi megabit uh, per second range. Um, the, the last uh, but not the least uh, challenging uh, issue is the interoperability. Okay? The telecommunication carriers has invested billions of dollars in the existing infrastructure. Mm? It will be impossible for them to, to tell them to really abandon all these existing infrastructure and then go for the new technologies. Okay? So whatever new technologies we come up with, we better make sure it's back what compatible with the existing infrastructure. And that's another challenge. As a matter of fact, when you think about TCP and IP, they are actually legacy protocols. But they work very well in the past 30 years. So the idea is how you can improve those protocols to work on different platforms and heterogeneous technologies. All right. So let me just talk about one of the uh, very exciting new technology called uh, optical network technology called wavelength division multiplex. Okay. This is a research project that I have been uh, involved with with uh, uh, Lincoln Laboratory at MIT and a number of other companies involving AT&T, um, Nortel, JDS, uh, Uniface. Um, this technology is, is an optical technology that enables a very cost-effective terabit per second bandwidth in backbone optical networks. And the ongoing research that we have in this next generation internet project funded by DARPA, okay, that's about a $16 million project that we have at MIT um, that goes on the, for another year or so, um, is to develop very efficient WDM architectures and protocols to support terabit per second even in the access area. Access area means the last mile that connects your corporate uh, router to the central office in a local carrier. Okay? Again, you have a lot of bandwidth in the backbone, but very limited bandwidth in the access area. And our goal is try to really increase the bandwidth in the, even in the access area. All right. So let me explain a little bit about how this technology works without going into much detail. Okay. Um, to just oversimplify a little bit, the technology allows you to divide the spectrum okay, of in an in a optical fiber into multiple channels. So that uh, in, in current technology, you can actually uh, divide the optical spectrum into maybe 100 channels now, if it's each channel running at about 2 gigabit per second. So immediately, you can already have two gigabit, 200 gigabit per second in the fiber easily. Okay? In the future, it might go up to a few hundred uh, channels, and with each channel going at 10 gigabit per second. So then you can have multi terabit per second. Okay? So the, um, the reason why this is such an attractive technology is that it offers you very low cost. Okay? Because many of the components you use uh, are passive components. Okay. Again, to oversimplify, you can think of them as just mirrors and prisms. Okay. So it can bypass the electronic bottleneck. Currently, of course, optical fiber is used to connect electronic switches. But every time your signals has to be converted from optical signal to electric signal and then get processed by these routers. So we're hitting already the electronic performance bottleneck. But by replacing those electronic switches by optical components, such as mirrors and prisms, Okay, you don't have the electronics performance bottleneck, so you can be switched at a much faster rate, a terabit per second. All right. The challenge is how we can actually scale, again, these kind of technologies so that millions or even hundreds of millions of users can access them, access them at a very low cost, and how we interoperate with the existing billions of infra, billions of dollars of electronic infrastructure. Okay, that have been invested by the carriers. All right, and uh, how all these existing TCP/IP protocol works over these optical technologies, all right? And this is a, uh, the WDM-based architecture that we have designed in this next-generation internet projects funded by DARPA. Um, above, at the, uh, in the above left-hand corner, is the um, is the backbone network. Okay, for example, this and this part is usually referred as the access area. Okay, access area. Could be, for example, a Boston metropolitan area, okay. And each of these nodes is called the access node, and usually is connected in a ring fashion, and that's usually referred to the feeder network. 
this ring could be about 50 kilometer in diameter. All right. And after, the, after connected to all these excess nodes are what we call the distribution networks. And they could be arranged in a tree-like fashion or a ring-like fashion. And each of these little dots, okay, an example of like could be, for example, MIT campus router or a Harvard. Okay. And uh, the idea is uh, we want to provide terabit per second, okay, even in the access area. Okay. Currently, I guess most of you use the local area network, which is about 10 megabit per second. Okay. And what we want to do is provide very high bandwidth to the desktop so that you can really receive all kinds of signals, data, video, on your desktop. And that's also uh, a trend in the convergence of the television with the PC. Okay that you can actually get all sorts of information, video, um, uh, video on demand, everything at a very low cost using a single infrastructure rather than you receiving it, uh, your voice from telephone network and your uh, broadcast uh, TV signals from another cable infrastructure. Again, this is regarding uh, lowering in cost. Okay. So I already mentioned that the, uh, in the distribution area, the reason why optical technology is so attractive is it's passive. Okay, it doesn't require power. Okay, the power is really uh, needed only at the end uh, station as well as to the central office. One of the challenges is that internet traffic, unlike voice, is very bursty. When you download, when you browse the web, most of the time you're idling after you download the web page. Okay, so it's very bursty in nature and it's very hard to predict the traffic. And that causes a lot of uh, challenging issues in using optical technologies because optical technologies are circuit switching, okay, in general. That means you establish light path, okay, uh, between end users, okay. And my research focuses on how we can share those wavelengths or channels very effectively, okay, in the sense that if you have 64 wavelengths or channels and it's to be shared by, let's say, 2,000 buildings, how are you going to share them in a very efficient manner? Uh, under the assumption that the internet traffic is very bursty. Okay. So this is a, a very challenging issue uh, that we have been uh, looking at. Uh, the idea is we want to really, currently the, your cable modem at home, if you use cable modem, offers you about a megabit per second. Okay. What we try to build in this project, okay, in the optical project, is the, um, to build another modem, but we call it the optical modem, that can offer you a gigabit per second. Okay, so a thousand times faster modem okay, uh, that can be connected to your PC. Okay. Now let me switch gear. Okay. That's another major area of my research is on the wireless area. Okay. So before we talk about a wireline technology okay, using optical fiber, WDM technology. And uh, another major area of, re of my research is in the next generation wireless technologies. And this is a joint project with uh, Entity Docomo. Uh, for those of you who don't know on TT Docomo, it is the, mo the major mobile operator in Japan. Okay? It's a spin-off from uh, the parent company NTT, but now it's a much larger company than the parent company NTT. It is, uh, about the, it is the fourth largest company in the world in terms of market cap. Okay? So they, and they are really very advanced in wireless technology, uh, a major be, uh, player behind the standardization of the third generation system. Okay? Um, I would like to give you some, uh, uh, maybe the, a historical overview of how the wireless system evolved. Okay, in the uh, late 80s or mid 80s, we have the analog uh, system that we refer to the first generation system. Actually, if you uh, are a subscriber to Cellular One, some of the phones are still based on analog. Okay, um, again, because there's already a lot of money invested in those uh, analog infrastructure. And right now, you can get very low cost if you use analog technology. And in the early, in the early 90s, uh, we saw the, um, the digital second generation system, which is based on digital technology. Uh, that's, for example, GSM and the uh, CDMA technology used in the USA. And they offer you about 10 kilobit per second. Okay. The reason why we only need such a low bandwidth in this uh, system is that most of the communications or the traffic evolve only voice. Okay, and voice is a very predictable, uh, it is a kind of very predictable bandwidth uh, traffic. Okay, and uh, compressed voice only requires about 10 kilobit per second. Okay. And in the emerging third generation system, it is based on what we call the wideband CDMA technology. 
the standard is called IMT, IMT 2000. Um, and in third generation technology uh, that will be rolled out in Japan next year, in the US it probably will take another two years before we see this technology. Um, it has promised to offer you about a 300 to 400 kilobit per second for a mobile user. If you're driving in a car, this is probably what you'll get, about 300 kilobit per second. And that will allow you to have a pretty good uh, a bandwidth in order to browse the web. The reason why we they came up with this uh, number, 300 kilobit per second, is that a typical web page with some graphics in it, actually, is about 300 kilobit. Okay. So, and they um, calculate that a human's response to tolerance is about one second. If you download a web page more than one second, you'll feel impatient. So that's how they designed the technology at the beginning, with 300 kilobit per second. Uh, and that will be combining voice and a limited amount of video uh, you can <coughs> see uh, using your uh, cell phone or handheld devices. And what I've been working with uh, Entity Docomo is on the even futuristic or future generation, on the fourth generation. Okay. In that technology, we are trying to think of a totally different kind of technology, which is not based on the current cellular system. It will be purely on IP-based, internet protocol-based technology, packet switching. Okay. Because the bandwidth in the wireless system or the, the radio spectrum, unlike the optical spectrum you have in the fiber, is very, very precious okay, because of the noise uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, whereas in the optical fiber, we can have easily terabit per second. Uh, in the wireless spectrum, uh, it will be very difficult to even get megabit per second. Okay? So uh, a big difference, a million times difference in terms of the efficiency. And there we want to uh, get up to t two megabit per second or even 10 megabit per second. In that case, you can even actually view ex high, high definition TV on your handheld device. Okay, that's really the goal in the future. And they have even planning already in 2006 and or seven to roll out this service. Okay. Um, and again, the, the third generation is based on the wideband CDMA. Um, and this is used in the third generation technology. And some other issue have to do with the convergence with backbone networks. Okay. If you really want to have very high end-to-end -end performance, okay, the wireless spectrum or the wireless network only represents, as we say, the, at least the last mile technology. Okay. Because fiber uh, will be built, fiber networks will be built, optical networks will be built, we should make use of the fiber, the enormous bandwidth available in the wireline network and use the wireless part as the, really the last mile connection. Okay, so just uh, now let me get back to what can be done currently. Okay, I'm going from the future generation now back to the present. Okay, currently you can actually buy what we call the WAP phone. Okay, uh, WAP stands for the Wireless Application Protocol phone from uh, a carrier, which allows you to actually browse the web over the existing second generation technology. All right, this is the current World Wide Web paradigm in the wireline network. This represents your, the desktop PC. Okay, it's a very simple client and server technology. Okay, you send a request URL, you visit the website. The website may run some CGI script and return a response to your desktop PC. Very simple um, client-server paradigm. Okay, the WAP, the wireless application protocol paradigm, is a little bit different. Okay, now you have a handheld cellular uh, phone. Okay, and this is the over the wireless network. What is different is now you have a, a WAP gateway that is owned by the wireless carrier okay, in the middle. Okay. This part is, is like the existing HTTP. This is the current uh, uh, internet protocol. But what is different is now that the, uh, you now have to change. This is over the wireless part, which they have now to change the current TCP IP standard in order to work over the unreliable and low bandwidth communication network in the wireless area. Okay. So now you have to have a proxy in the middle okay, to uh, forward your HTTP request to the web server. All right. okay. And there's also one distinct function of that doesn't exist in the current uh, World Wide Web is the, is the push function. Okay. Currently, uh, the, your, your web browser works in the pool paradigm. Right? Whenever you want to get information, your PC actually pull the information from a web server. But uh, in the WAP network architecture, we actually have a push paradigm. That means the server,
can actually push information to your cell phone. Okay? That creates a lot of issues even involving economics. Okay? Because um, if you have a cell phone, okay, if some of the advertisement want to push information to your cell phone, who pay for the airtime uh, air cost? So all these have not really been uh, sorted out yet. But there's a big market now in the wireless internet. And people should now try to rush into the area okay, very quickly. And uh, just want to mention quickly that there's a lot of business opportunities. You can recently see a lot of IPOs of wireless uh, internet uh, startups. Because uh, there's a lot of opportunity. The existing World Wide Web built on HTML. But if you want to browse the web using your cell phone, you have to reformat all the web pages into a different language called wireless markup language. Okay? So a lot of these companies are doing this kind of conversion okay, to help companies to migrate to the wireless platform. Okay? I don't want to go into too much detail now, but I just want to uh, conclude in the uh, two more slides. Uh, that this is the current PC application, okay, the, the paradigm of the internet. You have a uh, PC connected to the relatively slow internet, up to a few maybe 100 kilobit per second. Um, and uh, every so often, every two years, Microsoft will ask you to upgrade your operating system. So you're paying a lot, okay, because you have to keep on upgrading software to deal with all the new applications. All right? And um, in the future, okay, we will have the three client broadband internet model. All right? And this is what we call the application service provider model. Okay? Uh, in the sense that you no longer need to really upgrade your software maybe every one or every two years. The upgrading of the surf software will be done at an ASP server. Okay? What you really need is just a Netscape browser or Internet Explorer browser, what we call a thin client. Most of the processing is done at the server level. Okay? Of course, besides a PC, a thin client PC, you may have a PDA, a laptop, and a cell phone, okay? all connected to this broadband internet. In a sense, this broadband technology allows us to see the whole internet as a local area network. Okay? Even though this server is maybe across the nation, you will see that actually almost like in your local office because of a broadband internet. So that's a shift in the paradigm. And uh, even Microsoft is seeing this model as a competing to their really heavy PC model. Okay? Um, so we are seeing a lot of changes in the uh, internet industry. Okay? Now let me conclude this by uh, actually saying something that you hear a lot more about uh, this work, how to network physical objects in the afternoon talks uh, given by Professor Sama. Um, is this is the ultimate vision, what we call in the thin client. So instead of talking about cell phone, okay, we're now talking about a barcode. Okay, but of course not the existing barcode. It's a chip that costs only a penny to be embedded in any pieces of consumer goods that you can imagine. For example, a uh, piece of Thai box manufactured by Procter & Gamble, actually our sponsor for this work. Um, so in the future, a lot of these um, existing barcodes, we call the uniform product code, UPC barcode, will be replaced by a tag which is electromagnetic tag okay, that you can sense or read, or you can read, without actually scanning them. Okay? Current barcode, if you go to the supermarket, you have to check out at the, uh, the long queue in the checkout counter, and uh, you have to really scan every piece with a line of sight. With these new technologies, okay, you don't have to scan them or scan them anymore directly. It will be, it's like if you have a bunch of objects which are tagged this, which are tagged by these low-cost tagging technologies, you have a PDA or a cell phone, you can sense everything around you without actually scanning them. Okay? And this is happening. Okay? And let me show you. Uh, maybe I can show this. This is a uh, chip. You can even see it at the, at the middle. This is a business card given to me by Motorola, our sponsor. Okay? At the middle is something like a, a two millimeter chip. Okay? That is going to replace a barcode. All right? And right now, it costs about two cents and have 1,000 bit in it. Okay? Okay? I don't know how you know how many uh, objects can you tag in 1,000 bit. Okay? Uh, with 350, uh, 350 bits, you can actually uniquely identify every single atom in the universe. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, so with 1,000 bit, you can really last a long time, I guess. <laughs> All right? If you can find a place to stick up. Okay, yeah. So, uh, and this is very low cost. Okay? Every day, there are three billions of objects being scanned. Okay? 
And now with this tagging technology, you can imagine there will be trillions of objects sensed, okay, maybe in every hour. Okay. So this is going to create the next revolution in the internet. Okay. The internet will be used not just to retrieve information, but will be used to actually connect physical objects to obtain physical information. And I guess uh, you can already see there are a lot of applications on manufacturing, infantry control, supply chain management, and really key impact on the next generation e-commerce. And I don't want to really talk too much because Professor Sama will be talking a lot more about this in the afternoon. And I would like to stop here and maybe take one question. Sure. In the 60s, uh, Thomas Watson, who was at the time head of IBM, right, he said that he predicted that uh, in the future there will be only two or three major computers in the world, right? Then the 80s, the personal computer became uh, popular. So this statement became the subject of much ridicule because, you know, uh, as an example of how famous people can falter when they predict the future. But now, when you look at the internet, it begins to appear that computers that we have on our desks are actually our clients, they're not so much computers anymore. The actual compute, the computing is distributed. So mm -hmm. do you think that actually, after all, Watson was right? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as you say, we'll see that now uh, at the, my last slide show, right? Um, right now, a lot of the computing power, if the ASP model is right, will be pushing all the computing power back to a centralized uh, uh, a, a, uh, a computer, right? because the server is getting more and more powerful, whereas all the devices that you want to wear, okay, or maybe distribute around this room, will get less and less computation and power. And maybe they could be passive. By the way, I didn't mention, the, the, the tech that I show you, manufactured by Motorola with uh, only two cents, is passive, no battery. Okay? So a lot of power, actually, you get it from the atmosphere. All right? So to answer your question, uh, you know, I don't have the crystal ball in front of me, so I cannot tell you the future. Uh, but I will have to say that a lot in the future, everything will be distributed. Okay? And there will be a shift in paradigm, okay, continuous shift in paradigm, back and forth, depends on the advances in technology. Okay. okay. Well, I think in the interest of actually getting to lunch on time, since uh, you probably don't want to eat cold food, why don't we uh, turn to the next speaker? Okay. Um, and you can ask uh, Professor Sue more yeah. questions. <laughs> okay, the next speaker is me. Uh, I'm Seth Lloyd. I'm a uh, Finn Mechanical Career Development Associate Professor of Mechanical Engineering. I don't know why they gave me the longest title of the whole department. Um, is that the longest? I don't know. Finn Mechanical is a long word. I, I almost never get, can say it. Um, so uh, I would like to talk to you about quantum computers. Um, now, uh, who here has heard of Moore's Law? Who here has not heard of Moore's Law? Okay, a couple of people. Moore's law is this law that, that was proposed by uh, Moore, the chairman of Intel in the 60s. He pointed out that the size of the components of computers, and hence the power of computers, the size of comp components was going down by a factor of two every two years. And as a result, the power of computers was going up by a factor of two every two years. Okay? If you extrapolate this, this means that in uh, every, uh, every uh, 10 years, all right, or if, sorry, every 20 years, you go down by a factor of 1,000 in size. As uh, Papkin de Terosian pointed out, the current scale on uh, computer chips is 0.1 micron. That means that if we go on for another 20 or 25 years, we'll actually have computers that are at the scale of atoms. Now, it's not clear if we're going to get there, because Moore's law is a phenomenological law about human ingenuity. It's not, not a law of nature. But if we are going to get there, we're going to have to use quantum mechanics. And uh, that's what I'm going to tell you about. OK, so who here has heard of the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle? All right, who here has not heard of the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle? See, it's even more famous than Moore's Law. Okay? The Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle is what, how quantum mechanics tells you the limits on how well you can measure things and on how fast you can do things at the quantum scale. And the devices that I'm going to describe to you actually operate at the limits that are given by the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. So quantum computers are where Moore's law meets the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. OK? <coughs> I don't think it deserved that. <laughs> OK, so 
in the interest, I, I will, luckily I'm using actually archaic technology to do this, so I will actually be able to cut my talk in half, okay? <laughs> now, what are quantum computers? By the way, I was thinking when, when Nam, Nam uh, uh, to point it out that during my interview I said I knew a lot about mechanical engineering and I was trying to think what he was talking about and then I realized that I actually did say that I did know a lot about quantum mechanical engineering. In fact, you can think I am in fact a quantum mechanical engineer because what I really know about is how to make things happen at small scales. And that's what I'm going to tell you to now. How to make things happen when the systems that you're trying to make, that you're trying to engineer are quantum mechanical. What are quantum computers? Okay. They're devices, well, they're computers, all right? They process information. They store information on individual atoms, nuclear spins, or photons, that is to say, uh, at the quantum scale, all right? They operate at the physical limits of speed, dissipation, and memory, right? They operate at the limits that are determined by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, all right? And finally, they preserve information, sorry, they process information in a way that preserves quantum coherence. What does this mean? Well, I'll tell you in just a second. All right. <clears throat> so, one of the main things you've got to remember about quantum mechanics, who here, by the way, has, a, has ever taken a course in quantum mechanics? All right, see? I mean, this, is, this shows you that the physics-based paradigm for engineering really is a physics-based paradigm. All right, so now you guys who took, and women who took courses in quantum mechanics know that quantum mechanics is weird, right? Quantum mechanics is weird. Strange stuff happens, and down at that microscopic stale, scale, things do not behave in the same way they do at the macroscopic scale. All right, so if I'm going to tell you some stuff and it sounds weird, right, and you don't quite understand it, that's good. All right, Niels Bohr once said, anybody who can contemplate quantum mechanics without getting dizzy hasn't properly understood it. All right, <clears throat> so if, you, if you're feeling dizzy, that's good. It doesn't mean you're actually understanding it, right? It just means that it's good. If you're not feeling dizzy, that's bad. So, however, I can tell you a lot, a lot about all the quantum weirdness you really need to know for to understanding quantum computation in a nutshell, all right, on just one transparency. And it goes under the name of wave-particle duality. So, what quantum mechanics says is that stuff that we normally think of as waves, like sound or light, is actually made up of little tiny particles. Light is made up of photons, sound is up, made up of phonons. Okay? So that if you look at a very, 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 very faint light, and you have a detector, a photodetector for detecting light, rather than just giving you a continuous signal, at some point it will start just giving you little, little clicks, and each click is a photon, a light particle hitting that photodetector. Similarly, stuff that we think of as particles, like uh, atoms, or for that matter, basketballs, okay, actually corresponds to a wave. So if I like pick this thing up in the air and throw it up there, all right, not a very good particle, but it's still, this clip has a quantum mechanical wave that's associated with it. And that means that particle-like properties like position, for instance, are sort of smeared out when you get down to the quantum scale because there's a wave-like nature that's associated, say, with the position and momentum of this clip as it goes flying through the air. Okay? Now, <clears throat> One thing you've got to remember, this, okay, so that's fine. That doesn't sound so weird, except that it is kind of weird. Because the important thing here is that the waves in quantum mechanics, just like ordinary waves of light or waves of water or waves of sound, they can add up. So if this is an okay wave for a quantum system, all right, for this particle, and this is an okay wave for a quantum system, well, then so is this. So it's okay to have a quantum particle that has a wave that has support in two places at once. And a particle that's described by this is, in some weird quantum sense, in two places at once. All right? Now, uh, is this okay? But does this, is this weird? Yes. Okay. Is, are people willing provisionally to accept this, even if it's, it's weird? Uh, who, who doesn't want to accept this provisionally? Nobody. Okay, good. Otherwise, I would have to tell you to leave the room because everything, if you accept this provisionally, then actually everything I'm going to tell you about quantum computation, all right, you're going to have to accept. So there's no, you know, that's why I don't want like two minutes down the road to have people backtracking and saying, hold it. All right? Okay, good. So I'm going to take five more minutes and I'll tell you about it. Now, 
in computers, we store information on electrons, right? A capac we store them in capacitors, really. A capacitor is like a bucket for electrons. A whole bunch of electrons over here is a zero. A whole bunch of electrons over here is a one. That's how computers work. Now, let's go down to the level where we're storing information on a single electron. Let's say, and an atom is actually a very nice example of a capacitor, right? You can put energy in it, excited to an excited state, the, electron, the, the shape of the electron cloud around the atom changes. So let's think of an atom as electron over here, ground state, registers a zero. Electron over here, excited state, registers a one. The atom's storing energy when you go from this, when you go from zero to one. Okay? That's fine. We're just going to call the ground state zero and we're going to call the first excited state one. We can do that. That's fine. Now, the thing is, it's okay for an electron, indeed electrons like doing this, it's okay for an electron to be in the ground and excited state at the same time. That is a quantum bit or a qubit can register in some weird quantum sense, it can register zero and one at the same time. Okay, are there any objections to this so far? Good, people were convinced, uh, that's, uh, the people were convinced by my saying that you weren't allowed to object at this point. Okay, great. So, what can you do? So a quantum computer is a system that stores information on quantum bits or qubits. So a quantum bit, let's call it zero, right? Zero is electron over here. One is electron over here. Zero plus one is the sum of the waves. It's a physical state of the system. You add up the waves that correspond to zero and one. It's some funny state that registers zero and one at the same time. Now, if that's not bad enough, if I take a whole bunch of these guys, all right, let's say I take 10 of them, and I put each one in this funny state, zero and one at once, zero and one at once, zero and one at once, et cetera. All right? I ask what's the state of all of them together. Well, it's a wave with, remember, every component is represented. So I've got a wave with zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one, zero, one, 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 one. I have 1,024, which is two to the 10th, I have 1,024 components, and my 10 quantum bits are in some funny quantum sense registering all the numbers between 0 and 2 to the n minus 1, 0 and 1023, written in binary form, at once. Okay? So, we're at, what we're actually doing is on a small number of quantum bits, a small number of electrons, we're actually registering a very large number of numbers. As Sonny pointed out, if I had 350 bits, okay, 2 to the 350, which is around you know, 10 to the 110, is way more than the number of particles in the universe. There are only like 10 to the 90 particles in the universe. All right? So <clears throat> the power of, infor and this of course is why information is so powerful. With a small number of things, you can tag a lot of stuff. A lot more stuff than you'd ever want to tag. And in this case, in our quantum bits, we're actually able to do it all at once. So this is kind of funky. And what can you do with this? Well, here's how you do quantum co computation. You have a little, a little gate, a quantum logic gate, which is something that, for instance, moves electrons around. I've actually done this in terms of photons, because photons are very nice things for storing information on. A photon can wiggle this way, which I'll call zero, or it can wiggle this way, which I'll call one. It's pretty easy to do this. You just take out your ray bands, right? And you polarize the light, so it's wiggling this way, or it's wiggling this way. But they can also wiggle this way, all right? And that's a state that's zero and one at the same time. And so I can make a little gizmo, and I'll describe very briefly how you make gizmos like this. And you can do logic. You can make the photons interact with each other, or you can make the electrons interact with each other. Indeed, nature does this for you, because nature gives you physical interactions, quantum mechanical interactions between these systems. And you can do little logic gates. So here's, for example, a gate where the first guy that goes through stays the same, all right? And the next guy that goes through gets flipped if the first guy was one. It's called a controlled knot gate, because you do a knot on the second bit controlled on whether the first one's a one or not. And now you have this funky situation where if you put zero plus one in the first bit, then, well, when you've got zero there, the first, the second guy does nothing, and when you have one, the second guy flips. Okay. So you can do logic. 
And you know that doing logic, if you look inside a regular computer, it's just got all these little logic gates in there that takes bits two by two, one by one and two by two, makes them interact with each other, and all of a sudden you're playing Doom, right? Okay, so you can take the mathematical way of saying this is that you can put in some input, x, and you can calculate arbitrary functions, f of x, arbitrary digital functions. Well, in quantum computation, what you can do is you can take all these inputs at once, okay, and you can calculate f of x on all these inputs at once. That is something you cannot do on a classical computer, and that is where the power of quantum computation comes from. Okay, now. Have I, have I, uh, is this reasonably clear? I'm just, the, the, remember, it started out, the world is quantum mechanical, quantum mechanical things can be in two states at once, quantum bits can be in two states at once, that means a quantum computer can do two things at once. More than that, it can do lots and lots and lots of things at once, and that's why you can do more on a quantum computer than you can, can do on a conventional computer. Does this make sense? All right, I'm sorry? <laughs> okay, so how do we build these things? And then I'll stop. So really, actually, uh, now uh, remember that, that Popkin de Tarosian said the difference between an engineer and a physicist is that engineers do things, right? So when I became, came here and became a mechanical, quantum mechanical engineer, I felt obliged to start doing stuff. All right, actually, I was already doing stuff before I came here. But it's been extremely helpful for, for me uh, to be in an environment where people are doing things because engineers know how to do things. So what I've been doing is I've been building quantum computers. I've also been working on large systems and complex systems as well. But largely what I've been doing is qu building quantum computers because uh, this is what the government will give one money to do these days. Okay, so how can you do it? You can do it by a whole variety of means. You can use nuclear magnetic resonance. It's essentially exactly the same technology that when you blow your knee out skiing, you know, you go and sit in some big magnet and it makes a lot of clicking sounds, all right, and it takes an image of your knee. You can modify that technology very slightly to put a bunch of molecules inside the magnet, zap them with microwaves, and make them perform these kinds of simple logic operations that I described. Uh, with David Corey here at MIT, we now have the world's records quantum computers. They're about 10 bits. They can perform a few thousand operations, okay? They're small <coughs> and they're slow, but they are performing these operations at the atomic scale. There's one angstrom between the bits. Quantum optics is a beautiful way for doing uh, quantum computation. I'll describe in a second how you do that. Quantum dots are nice ways of doing this. Um, <coughs> a very, a very uh, interesting way of uh, performing quantum computation is to use superconducting circuits. I don't know if, uh, if you read science, you may notice that, that uh, they just announced a result of a group of which I'm a member um, in collaboration with Delft, they made superconducting circuits where you had a whole bunch of electrons going around this way, we'll call that a zero, okay? And a whole bunch of electrons going around this way, we'll call that a one, and you have this funny quantum state where they're doing that at the same time. Now, people have been trying to do this for more than 30 years, create a whole bunch of electrons going around this way and a whole bunch of electrons going around that way at the same time, without success until now, right? Until just this last year. How did it manage to happen now? Okay, well, and actually why am I able to work on all these kinds of projects without like just falling apart? There's a reason, what I, my goal, my role in these projects is not to do the experiments because you need world-class experimentalists who really know what they're doing in that particular field in order to make this happen. My role is really a designer to design these quantum systems and the tools that I've learned from NAM to do this are axiomatic design, all right? Axiomatic design is what actually allows you to do this. Why? Because at this very small scale, you're very constrained by nature, right? It's very, you know, the atoms are already there. They know, you know, nature says they have to behave in a certain way. You cannot design an electron. It just comes that way. Luckily, they're all identical, okay? Nature fabricates them to exact precision. However, in order to make these things operate in this very constrained environment, you have to be very careful about having uncoupled designs. And you could say that my role in these collaborations is to ensure that the designs are uncoupled. That's why we're actually being able to do this. And that's why I think we have a hope of actually making this happen on a much larger scale. Okay, let me, I think I'm running out of space here, running out of space and time. Oh, it's time for lunch. So let me just wind this down here. What else can you do? I won't tell you any more about how you do this. Let me just talk about a few more applications that we have here. 
Um, <clears throat> we just received a multi-million dollar Murray project together with the electro RLE here, and the RLE here, to do quantum communication. That's where you take in quantum information, like stored on photons. Remember, this way is zero, this way is one, polarization. Move them down an optical fiber, bring them over here, and pick them up on the other side. Okay, there's lots of problems with this. It's very difficult to do these experiments in general because quantum systems are small, all right? They're at the angstrom scale. They're hard to engineer, and they're hard to manipulate, and they're very sensitive. You know, you sneeze, your atoms get a cold at the quantum level. So how are we gonna do this? Well, luckily, uh, I and our collaborators, we came up with a design for what we call quantum internet, okay? This is uh, not like the internet that Sonny was talking about, except that it consists of computers that are connected together by communication lines. In this case, these are quantum computers that are connected by quantum information lines, all right? Now, well, in our case, they're atoms. They sit in little optical cavities. We zap them with light. We communicate by, these, by photons. It's actually very hard to make this happen, but by thinking carefully about what parts of, these design, of this design can be decoupled from the other parts, we actually have a very nice design, and we ought to have little networks, okay, with a few links in them in a couple of years. Where is this all going? <clears throat> okay, and here's the end. <clears throat> so we can all go have lunch in a second. Currently, we have five to 10 quantum bits. We can do about 1,000 operations. That doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to remember that four years ago, we had no qubits and no operations, all right? And in fact, then a couple of years, two years ago, we had four qubits, and we could do about 10 operations. So we've got a kind of inverse Moore's law going on here, all right? Every couple of years, we managed to double the number of qubits that we have. In the next few years, we're gonna have 20 to 30 quantum bits, about 10,000 operations. We're gonna have a two, maybe three link quantum internet in which we can move quantum information around from one place to another. So let's put this in the perspective of what Popkin Dutrosian was talking about this morning. Here's a picture of Moore's Law. Moore's Law essentially says, every 25 years, the scale size of components in computers goes down by a factor of 1,000. In 1950, we had vacuum tubes, 10 centimeters, all right, in size. In 1975, we had integrated circuits, but the components were down there at 10 microns or so, or so 100 microns in size. Now, <coughs> we have, we're at the scale where we uh, have feature sizes of a tenth of a micron. The National Semiconductor Roadmap actually takes us down to around 2010, which is pretty amazing given that using the, the techniques that we heard about this morning, which is quite remarkable that one's able to do that. Where are we? All right, right here, we're right here at the moment. Okay, this is Y2K. We're right here at the scale of atoms, 10 to the minus 10th, one angstrom. We're building small devices right here. We're making them larger and larger and larger. There's a huge, huge industry out there that is building larger devices, okay, at the order of 0.1 microns and making them smaller and smaller and smaller. What we're hoping is that sometime in the next 10 years ago, all right, we're gonna be tunneling up from the very, very small scale to the large scale of constructing larger and larger devices. And halfway in between, we're gonna meet people like Popkin who are coming down from the top and building the larger devices. And then we break through, we hope to be able to shake hands with each other and say, hey, how's it going, all right? <clears throat> so, but you look at, so let's just, let me just conclude, this is how we're going to, if we are going to be able to make Moore's Law continue to 2025, which is around when things are supposed to be the atomic scale, this is how we're going to have to do it. We're going to have to store things at the atomic level. We're going to have to manipulate things using, um, you know, basic ordinary physics to do it. And we're going to have to use careful design principles such as axiomatic design in order to get us there. So let me stop there. Thanks. Mm.